more on the kinematics of circular motion. All right, a ball at the end of a string is being swung in a horizontal circle. The ball is accelerating because a, the speed is changing, b, the direction is changing, c, the speed and the direction are changing, or d, the ball is not accelerating. The answer that the textbook definitely wants you to say is b, but in fact, I think c might also be uh, justifiable. They don't really tell us what's happening to the speed. So it could be going faster, could be going slower, but it must be accelerating because the direction is certainly changing no matter what. So there must be acceleration um, because of the direction. A car is turning a tight corner at constant speed. A top view of the motion is shown. The velocity vector for the, for the car points to the east at the instant shown. What is the direction of the acceleration? And here we know it's going to be south, because the acceleration is going to point towards the center of the circle. So the acceleration points that way, at least at the moment shown. All right, reminder, a uniform circular motion occurs when an object travels in a circle at constant speed. The velocity, of course, is always changing. And the acceleration for, universe, for uniform circular motion is radial and of magnitude v squared over r. It's the uniform, the uniformity here, the fact that it's uniform speed, says that this is the only part of the acceleration. If the speed were changing, if the object say, were going faster and faster around the circle, then there'd be a component of the acceleration in the direction it would move as well. All right, so this is, if the object were increasing speed, so new case, but if v was increasing, then there would have to be some part of the acceleration this way, which we call the tangential acceleration. And therefore, the actual acceleration would be the combination of those two, or something like this. We're not going to deal a lot with that, but just so you know it's out there, objects can get faster and slower as they go around circles. To do that, they would need accelerations in the direction of motion or in opposite direction of motion. Here it says, draw a blue circle around the case or cases with the greatest acceleration and a red circle around the case or cases with the least. All the motion is at constant speed, so we don't have to worry about how that changes. To do that, we're going to want to take, we're going to go back to saying the acceleration is v squared over r. Um, and then we look here and we say, well, in case a, for instance, we have 40 squared over r. So that's going to be... 1600 over r. Whereas in case b, we're going to have 20 squared, which is 400, but it's going to be over 2r, which is uh, right, which uh, oh, sorry, over 2r. So that's going to be a total of 200. Uh, 200 over r. And here we're going to have 400, but it's going to be over 3r. And here we're going to have 900, but over 1r. This is going to be 1600, but over 2r, which is 800 over r. And here we're going to have 900 over 3r, which is going to be the same as 300 over r. So looking at that, uh, 1600 over r is clearly the most. And let's see. 900 over r is more than that, 8 is more than, right? So next, and then this. Then we gotta be careful. Uh, 400 over 3 is something like 130. So the least is gonna be this one. All right, the time it takes for the object to, to go around the circle exactly once is called the period. And we symbolize it with capital T. We often work instead with the frequency. In physics, we often go between these two. The frequency is defined as how often the object goes around the circle, or at what rate. The SI unit of frequency is 1 over second, or inverse seconds, which is usually abbreviated as hertz. Frequencies are often also measured in revolutions per minute, where one revolution is once around the circle, so rev RPM is once per minute, instead of once per second, which is the hertz. Uh, in one period, the object travels around the circumference 
uh, once, which is a distance of 2 pi r. You can notice and see pretty easily that the definitions of frequency and period are such that the frequency is always 1 over the period, and the period is 1 over the frequency. If you have one, you have the other. There's no new information there. You might wonder, if there's no information, then why do we bother having two different things? Which is a really good question. And it turns out that it's largely technological. It's generally easier to measure the period, because you just watch stuff happen. This goes around, you count. But it's often easiest to control the frequency, because the uh, output of an electric motor is going to be dependent on the frequency of the thing you apply to it. So it's just technological. Um, and it's baked in and kind of habit now. Right, a compact disc has a radius of 120 millimeters and spins at 540 RPM. How long does one revolution of the disc take in seconds? Remember, RPM is revolutions per minute. So we can do this sort of, uh, we could do this as an, as an analogy. We could say that there are 540 revs in one minute, which is 60 seconds. And since it's moving at constant speed, that this should be the same as the one revolution in time t, which is what we're looking for. And then solve that for t. You get that t is about 0.11 seconds. You equivalently and equally well could have done that the frequency, oops, the frequency is 540 revs per minute, which is 9 revolutions per second, or 9 hertz. And then the period is 1 over the frequency, which is 1 over 9 hertz, which is 0.11, 1 over seconds, sorry, 1 over 1 over seconds. or 0.11 seconds. And that would work fine too. Take a moment to read this comic. It's actually saying something relatively deep, although it's trying to be funny while it says it. Calvin's father says, playing a record. A record is like sort of a old school CD, which of course is just a physical version of an MP3. It's hard to teach physics in the 21st century as you're losing contact with all the devices that we use. But there you go. So playing a record, I'll show you something interesting. Compare a point on the label, on the edge of the, circle, of the disc, to a point near the center. Right, point at the, at the, on, the, on the label here, to a point on the, cent, at, on the edge. They both make a complete circle in the same amount of time. They have the same period. They go around in the same amount of time. But the point on the record's edge has a much greater distance to travel since it's a bigger circle, right? So it goes, it takes the same amount of time to go further distance. It must be traveling faster. And that's true. Two points on a solid disk move at two different speeds, even though they make the same number of revolutions per second. In other words, they're on the same disk, rotating at the same rate, but they must travel at different rates. In fact, if they didn't travel at different rates, they couldn't be a solid disk. They couldn't maintain the same, the same shape. This, as you can see, bothers Calvin. Don't let it bother you too much. The distance around the circle is, of course, the circumference, so the speed of an object must be the velocity is distance over time. Speed is distance over time. The distance is 2 pi r. The time is 1 period t. So it must be that v is 2 pi r over t. And since 1 over t is the frequency, it must also be that v is 2 pi r f, which is useful. So for instance, returning to our CD with a radius of 120 millimeters and spinning at 540 RPM, if there's a mode of dust stuck to the edge of the disk, how fast is it traveling in meters per second? And we really just use this formula. And we remember to convert, of course, which is important, the millimeters to meters. And I didn't explicitly show this here, but of course, hertz is 1 over seconds. So we end up with meters times 1 over seconds, which is meters per second. And the numbers grind out to be about 6.7, which is a pretty good clip. It's not crazy. You could run that fast, but still, it's a pretty good clip. Putting all this together, we get another form for the centripetal acceleration. Remember, the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, and I'm not changing that, that's always still true, but we know that v is 2 pi r over capital T, so I square that and do some stuff. Notice that the r squared over r, um, I get just one r left. 
2 pi quantity squared becomes 4 pi squared. And of course, t squared becomes t squared. So I get an alternate version, which is 4 pi squared over t squared times the radius. And then equivalently, because 1 over t is f, we could also bring that up and say it's 4 pi squared f squared times r. Here, the interesting thing is that the centripetal acceleration grows with the radius if the period is constant. So for that disk, for instance, for the CD or the record that Calvin's father was looking at, if you are tri twice as far from the center, then the acceleration is twice as large that you need, which means the force moving it that way is twice as large, which is why eventually if you make the disk big enough, it will fall apart under its own internal tensions because you'll be unable to provide the internal strength to give it the force that it needs to go around. Um, something similar happens uh, astronomically. Sometimes things wander too close to planets and they can't have the correct centripetal acceleration and so they get ripped apart. Uh, that's probably the origin of much of Saturn's moons. So as an example, if a mode of dust is touched to the edge of the disk, what is the magnitude of the acceleration that it feels in meters per second square? What force, would, what acceleration would you have to impart? And we just just grind out the numbers and we find the acceleration would be 4 pi squared times r times f squared. Again, remembering to convert to meters and eventually converting this to seconds. And we get quite a number, 384 meters per second squared. That's something like 40 g. <laughs> so the edge of the disk is going around pretty fast. It requires a pretty strong force internally. Uh, the flip side of that is that sometimes CDs fail. If you spin them fast enough, they'll fail. And then they do really nasty things. They fly apart uh, as projectiles. And it can be very dangerous. It doesn't happen to consumer things. But, for instance, at some point, the Mythbusters rigged it to see what would happen. And it was pretty impressive.